And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by, consenting unto his death. I held the raiment of them that slew him. Now remember, he's trying to convince his Jewish audience of what he is now attempting to do so far as they are concerned. He still wants them to realize that Paul is now simply a believer in this Jesus of Nazareth. All right? So, verse 21. He, the ascended Lord Jesus, he said unto me, Depart, for I will send you far hence to the Gentiles. Simple enough? Yeah. Now look at the next verse. And they, this Jewish crowd, they gave him audience unto this word. What word? Gentile. And when he dropped that word Gentile, look what happened. They lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth. It is not fit that he should live. You see that? Now that was the thinking of the Jew of Paul's day. They were still of that mentality that only the Jews had any relationship with God. Those Gentiles were nothing but pagan dogs. See? Now, that's just to give you that picture of the thinking of the Jew. Now, come back to chapter 9. Stephen has been martyred. Saul of Tarsus was heading up the persecution that brought it about. And now he's satisfied that he has cleansed the homeland of Israel of all these Jews who had embraced Jesus as the Messiah. He's either got them in prison or they're dead, which again is typical of religious zealots. Religious zealots only have one mind. If I can't get them to agree with me, kill them. And it's no different today. Your whole ethnic cleansing in Yugoslavia was the very same mindset. The Muslims said if they don't convert to the Muslim religion, kill them. The Orthodox said if those Muslims can't come under our religion, kill them. Well, that's exactly the way Saul of Tarsus was. If you can't get these Jews to recant and deny that Jesus was the Christ, put them to death. And he'd been successful. And he thought he had the homeland pretty well cleansed, so now he wants to go up to Damascus. Now, if you know your Middle East geography, Damascus is only probably 100, 125 miles to the north and east. It's not that far from the northern end of Galilee. So now he's going up to Damascus in Syria, all under the Roman Empire, of course, and he's going to arrest and bring back to Jerusalem for trial and prison or death to any Jews that he could find who had embraced Jesus of Nazareth as their Messiah. You got the picture? Now, again, that tells you how much clout the religious leaders of Israel had with the Roman government. Because even back in antiquity, you did not go into a foreign country and arrest people and drag them out. So he had to have extradition permission from the Romans and the Syrians to bring these Jews out of Syria back to Jerusalem. Okay, now let's pick it up. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. And Saul, Saul of Tarsus, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter, killing people against the disciples or the followers of the Lord. And he went to the high priest and he desired of him letters to Damascus. Now again, I think it was letters of extradition, permission to bring these Jews out of Syria into Jerusalem for their trial. And so he desired of the high priest letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, that is, who had embraced Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah, they had believed the gospel of the kingdom and they were Jewish believers. Now, they're not members of the body of Christ. They're not saved in this age of grace. They are still under the Jewish top line up here. They are still on 
that prophetic program. All right, so now he goes to Damascus, and he wants to bring them bound to Jerusalem. Verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. Now remember, this is a religious Pharisee. He knows all about the God of heaven. And immediately when that tremendous light came from heaven, old Saul of Tarsus knew he was dealing with God. Now he certainly had no idea it was Jesus of Nazareth, but he knew it was God. It was a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, whether he was walking or on donkey or horseback is beside the point. He fell prostrate on the earth. And he heard a voice saying unto him, from heaven, now remember, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Now remember when I was back in the Old Testament this morning, who was Lord all the way up through? God the Son. God the Son was the Lord. He was Jehovah. And so what he's really saying is, who are you, Jehovah? Even he may not have said it on his mouth, his mind had Jehovah. Who are you, Jehovah? Because that was the name of God so far as Israel was concerned. Who are you, Jehovah? And now look, Jehovah answered, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Can you imagine how the man must have felt? Here the very God he thought he was serving by stamping out all these Jews who had put their faith in Christ's Messiahship was the God he was dealing with. Now, I'm going to show you in just a moment how much this man suffered over about 25 years of time for the sake of the gospel. How in the world did he put up with it? Because he never forgot the suffering and the murder that he himself had caused when he was trying to stamp out any semblance of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, I just can't make it graphic enough how that man must have just melted in heartache and heartbreak that the very name he was trying to stamp out was the Jehovah of the Old Testament. Never lose that. And so immediately, he didn't have to argue, he didn't have to play, oh God, I'm not that bad. Immediately, Saul of Tarsus became a believer in Jesus Christ. Now, you want to remember, this whole concept of our gospel, that Christ died for the sins of the world, and that he was buried and he rose from dead, was not revealed until Paul goes out into the desert. So Paul is not saved by what we call our gospel of grace. Now, before I go any further, I'm going to have to clear away all your cobwebs. Jesus and the twelve, under the law, only to the nation of Israel, preached the gospel of the kingdom. The good news that the king is coming and is going to set up his kingdom, promised to Israel, under the law. Never did Jesus or Peter or anybody else tell the Jew to stop temple worship. So under Christ's ministry... And I've said it over and over on the program and wherever I teach. Everything that Jesus said in that earthly ministry was under the law. Never did he tell anybody not to keep the law as Paul does. Never did he say you no longer have to keep temple worship. They maintain temple worship. They maintain their diet of, of kosher food. They were still under the law. That was the gospel of the kingdom. 
that they were to believe that Jesus was the Christ and that he was going to bring in the king and the kingdom. Now, with the appearance of this man, we're going to come into a whole new scenario. Everything is going to change under the same God. But instead of now proclaiming that the king is coming, we now proclaim that Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, died for the sins of the world, and that he arose from the dead. And that's the gospel of the grace of God. All right? So that you can see it in print, just stay here in Acts and go over to chapter 20. Keep chapter 9. I'm not through there. But I want you to be able to see the two terms used in Scripture. Jesus went into the synagogues preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Peter, in the early Acts, preaches the gospel of the kingdom. You killed the Messiah, but God has raised him from the dead. He's alive. He can still be your king. But now Paul never mentions that. Now Paul preaches the gospel of the grace of God. Acts 20, drop down to verse 24. Acts 20, verse 24. where he says to the Ephesian elders as he's on his way back to Jerusalem for the last time. He's at the end of his public ministry now because he's going to come under arrest and most of the remaining years of his life are going to be in prison in Rome. <clears throat> but in chapter 20, verse 24, none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify or to proclaim the gospel of the grace of God. To testify the gospel of the grace of God. Over and over throughout his epistles, he'll refer to it as my gospel, that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. And so here's where you have to draw that line of distinction. Jesus and the twelve in fulfillment of this Old Testament line of prophecy could preach nothing but the gospel of the kingdom in view of the prophetic program. But when Israel rejected it and God stopped it short and he opened up that timeline and he introduced the next 1900 and some years of not proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom but the gospel of the grace of God. What a difference. What a difference. We're not looking for a coming king. We are looking for the head of the body of Christ to meet us in the clouds of the air. See, and this is what separates all of this from this which is still in the future. Now, I hope you see what I've done. I've taken this and put it out here. And so after this 2,000-year interval of the gospel of the grace of God, then this timeline up here is still going to be fulfilled. Am I with you? Are you with me? Okay. So now this is why I adamantly teach a pre-tribulation rapture of the church because, you see, this church will never mix with that top line. It cannot. It's a whole different entity. The prophetic program was for Israel. The grace program is for Gentiles. And we are a heavenly people, whereas Israel is an earthly people. All of Israel's promises were earthly and will be earthly when Christ sets up his kingdom. Our promises as believers in the grace age are heavenly. And once we get into the heavenlies, we will never again be an earthly people. Now, I think, and I, gave, I have to say this carefully, 
I think that once Christ returns and sets up his kingdom, we will probably commute from the heavenlies and have places of authority in the earthly kingdom. I can't say that definitely, but whatever. We are a heavenly people. Israel is the earthly people, and you can't mix them. You cannot mix them. And so the church in no way, shape, or form can go into this final seven years. That's Israel. Now the rest of the world is going to come under the judgment of it, but so far as believers going into this seven-year period, that flies in the face of Pauline doctrine because Paul sets us so completely apart from that prophetic program that I've got in the top line. All right, now let's come back to Acts chapter 9, and I'll do this as hurriedly as I can because we only have about 45 minutes left. All right, Acts chapter 9. So after Saul of Tarsus realizes that the one he was trying to stamp out is the one he was actually trying to serve, then we come down to God dealing with Ananias, the very man that Saul probably intended to arrest. And now the Lord says to Ananias, oh, let's see, verse 11 and 12, the Lord said unto Ananias, Arise, go into the street which is called Straight, inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. In other words, God sets everything in order so that it will all work. When Saul of Tarsus has Ananias come in, he's going to be ready. All right, Ananias argues. Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to the saints at Jerusalem. And here in Damascus he has authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said, Go thy way. Now here's what I want you to highlight or mark. Here is where we have a complete change in the modus operandi. Up until now, God has been dealing with the nation of Israel under the law and in fulfillment of all the Old Testament covenants. Now we're going to see something totally different. And the Lord says to Ananias, Go thy way, for he, Saul of Tarsus, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles. Can you imagine how Saul must have felt when God says, I want to send you to those pagan Gentiles? Had he not been trying to overcome all the, the damage he'd already done, I imagine he would have rebelled. But he was in no place of rebellion. And so the Lord says, I'm going to send you to the, to the Gentiles. And then verse 16, Look what God promised this man. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, do you want to know how much he suffered? Come back with me to 2 Corinthians. And he still is. Do you know that the vast majority of Christendom wants nothing to do with this man? I've had so many people call and write and say, Les, I've always been told to almost hate this man, Paul. Really. Had a lady down in Georgia that wrote, she said, My, until I started listening to you, I hated Paul. I had both my daughters convinced to hate him, but she said, You've changed our thinking. Well, they weren't alone. I've heard it for the last 20 years. Well, my pastor says he doesn't even want to preach out of Paul. My Sunday school teacher says he shouldn't even be in our Bible. So I know whereof I speak. But look what the man went through so that you and I can have this great salvation. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 22. And the reason he had to write this was that the Corinthian believers were also turning against him. The Corinthian believers were saying, well, Paul, who are you? We can see that Peter 
spent three years with Christ. We'll listen to what Jesus said, but you, you're an imposter. And so he had to constantly defend his authority or his apostleship. And that's what he's doing right here. He is defending who he is and what he is in God's operation. All right, verse 22. So he's referring back to the 12, as well as some of the other Jerusalem, such as Apollos. And so Paul says, <coughs> are they Hebrews? Now remember, he's talking primarily about the 12. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? Now he humbles himself. I speak as a fool. But what's his answer? I'm more. He is head and shoulders above the twelve because he is now the designated apostle to go to the Gentiles. Israel is going to slip off the scene. The twelve are already losing their authority and all the things concerning Israel are falling through the cracks and now we're coming to this whole new unfolding of God's grace. All right? So he says, I am more in labor more abundant in stripes above measure in prison more frequent in deaths or near death, often. Now imagine, look what he went through. Of the Jews, five times I received the 40 stripes save one, or 39. Now you know what that was? Those 39 lashes with the cat of nine tails with sharp metal on the end normally was enough to almost kill a man of youth, and full strength. This man went through five of them. Can you imagine what his torso looked like from the waist up? Because see what they would do? They would take 20 lashes from the front and drag it up the back. They would take 20 lashes from the back and drag it up the front. So that by the time they were through with those 39 lashes, that torso was hamburger. And he went through five of them. Five of them. Near death? Often. All right, read on. Three times I was beaten with rods. Now, you remember that poor kid in Singapore a few years ago? My, the world cried because he was going to get a few lashes with a bamboo rod. Hey, the apostle took that three times which again was enough to kill a good man, but he survived it all. All right? Once he was stoned up there in central Turkey, in Derby and Lystra, they dragged him out. And do you know that the Greek in that is literally dragged him out like a dead horse? They literally tied a rope to his feet and dragged him out of the city for dead. That's what the apostle went through. All right, read on. Three times I suffered shipwreck. And those of you who were with us on the Mediterranean a few years ago, you got a pretty good idea what that was like. A night and a day I've been in the deep. And then in journeyings often, he was never home to rest up. In peril of water, in peril of robbers, in perils of his own countrymen, the Jews, in perils of the pagans, in perils in the city, in the wilderness, in the sea, amongst false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings, in cold and nakedness, and beside all those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches or those little assemblies that he had been founding throughout the Roman Empire. Listen, that's what that man suffered for the sake of the gospel. Just for the sake of the gospel. Well, let's come back. Come back to Acts chapter 9. Because we've got to follow this man now to the place where he becomes the revealer 
of what he calls the mysteries. Now, invariably, when I have people try to debate with me that I maintain that this is totally separate from this, and they try to swing the church up into the seven years of tribulation, I always have one answer for them. Have you ever studied the letters of Paul? Well, no. Have you ever made a study of the mysteries revealed to the Apostle Paul? They don't even know what I'm talking about. Well, here we go. Acts chapter 9. He's saved in a moment when he realizes who he's been trying to oppose, that it was Jesus of Nazareth. And then you come down to verse 20. After he has been relieved of his blindness and he's been fed, yes, he's been baptized according to the Jewish economy. Verse 20, <clears throat> straightway, straightway he preached Christ in the marketplace. That's not what it says. Where does he go? The synagogue. I mean, he's a Jew. He has no idea yet that God is going to give him a message for the Gentiles. It was Ananias that God spoke to. And so Saul of Tarsus has no idea that he's going to have a particular ministry to the Gentile world. And so as soon as he recognized that Jesus was who Peter, James, and John had been trying to tell Israel that he was, he thinks he's going to continue right on in the gospel of the kingdom. And so he goes to the synagogue, to the Jew. Now look what he preaches. Now watch your Bible carefully because I just told a, a teacher the other day, you've got to shock people once in a while. And the best way to shock them is have them read their Bible and then you put something in there that's totally off the wall. And then that wakes them up. All right, look at what your Bible says. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God that he died for the sins of the world and rose from the dead. No, it doesn't say that. He doesn't know that that's gospel. The only thing that was gospel so far was that Jesus was the Christ. See that? Okay, let's move on. And all that heard him were amazed that even this old persecutor had come to that place. And so... They were amazed that this was the one who had destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem. And he came hither, that is, to Damascus, for that intent, that he might bring them bound to the chief priest. Verse 22, but Saul increased the more in strength, confounding the Jews who dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is the Messiah, the Christ. That's all he knows just exactly what had been revealed during Christ's earthly ministry, that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ. Nothing about his death, burial, and resurrection. He doesn't know that yet. Okay, now I'll move on. After many days were fulfilled, now we don't know how long, a couple weeks, the Jews took counsel to kill him. That is, the unbelieving Jew, not the little company of believers like Ananias, but the rank and file of Jewry, now detesting Jesus of Nazareth as much as Saul had before, now they want to kill him. They're just as religious fanatic as he was. All right? So they took counsel to kill him, but their lying await was known of Saul, and these Jews watched the gates day and night to kill him. So then, Knowing that he could never get out of the gates of the city, these believers, like Ananias, and who were also adherents of Jesus of Nazareth, these disciples, not the twelve, for goodness sakes, these are just simply believing Jews in Damascus, took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. What a way to start a ministry. Horrors. How would you like to be dumped over a wall of a strange city in a foreign country in the middle of the night? But he was. All right, now then, we have to pick up a gap 
between Acts 25 and verse 26 by going to Galatians chapter 1. Now go to Galatians chapter 1. And here Paul picks up by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, remember? He picks up the account from his conversion outside of Damascus. And after they let him down the wall in a basket, where did he go? Well, he tells us right here. Galatians 1, verse 11. Now I wish I had all night. I really do. If I had the voice and the strength, I would just keep going until morning. Here we go. I certify you, brethren. Now here again, we always have to qualify. Who is Paul writing to? Gentile believers up in central Turkey, in the area called Galatia, Asia Minor. And to those little congregations who were now being bombarded by the Jerusalem church who were believers that Jesus was the Christ, but they're still under the law. And so under, I feel, the leadership of Peter, James, and John, they are sending people into Paul's little new-founded congregations under grace and trying to put them back under the law. And that's why the little book of Galatians was written because Paul was so alarmed that these Judaizers were coming into his little congregations and trying to put them back under Judaism instead of free from the law, putting them back under. So he almost hurriedly has to write this little letter to the Galatians. And the whole theme of these six chapters is you're not under the law. You're under grace. You don't have to keep circumcision. You don't have to keep the dietary laws. You don't keep what the law demands. You're under grace. Okay, so now let's look what he says. I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me, that is to bring these Gentiles out of their paganism, the gospel which is preached of me is not after or does not follow other men. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it by men, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Hold everything. What does revelation mean? Oh, an unveiling. A pulling the tarp off of something so that you can see it clear and plain. Where's Jesus Christ? In glory. He's in glory. And the ascended Lord is now revealing to this man this whole new concept of grace, separated from everything pertaining to Israel. And it all pertains to primarily Gentiles. Yes, Jews can be saved, but they're not very likely. But nevertheless, this was a whole new revelation that no one had ever heard before. And consequently, the Holy Spirit has prompted the apostle to use the word then, the revelation of the mysteries, the secrets, things that were kept in the mind of God and not to be revealed until this man Came on the scene. Now, let me take you back. Deuteronomy. Keep your hand in Galatians. Come back to Deuteronomy 29, 29. <clears throat> because I have to have scriptural authority to do and say what I'm doing. Deuteronomy 29, 29. Deuteronomy 29, 29. All ready? The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. 
Now, a secret means a secret means a secret. And what's a secret? Something that nobody else knows anything about. So secret things belong to the Lord, our God. He's sovereign. He can keep things secret as long as he wants to keep them secret. Now read on. But those things which are revealed. What's one of the other root words of being revealed? Revelation. See? But those things that have now been revealed that are a revelation belong unto us and to our children. Now, of course, Moses is writing to Israel. But nevertheless, the whole concept of God keeping things secret goes all the way up to the Apostle Paul. And this is what he means then, that how by revelation. Now, so that you can see what I'm talking about with regard to things being kept secret. Come back with me before you go to Galatians to Romans. Romans 16, verse 25. Romans 16, verse 25. Now, I've had seminars all over the country this summer, and I've asked every one of them, and I'll ask you, have you ever heard a Sunday morning sermon, have you ever heard a Sunday school class that used this verse? And if I get a hand here, it'll be the first one from here to Atlantic City. They never do. Nobody. Nobody. Okay. Romans 16, verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, the gospel of the grace of God, and the preaching of Jesus the Christ according to the revelation of of the mystery, the secret, which was kept secret since the world began. That says what it means, and it means what it said. That to this apostle was made a revelation of things kept totally secret from the time of creation until it was given to this man. Now, I'll give you another one. Ephesians. You got your hand in Galatians? That's just a couple pages to the right. Ephesians, chapter 3. I've got to start with verse 1. And we're going to get right back quickly to Galatians. Our time is running out. Verse 1. For this cause, in other words, because of all he's written in the first two chapters. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you, what? Gentiles. See? The prophets wrote to Israel. Jesus and the twelve ministered to Israel. This man ministers to you and I, the Gentiles. And isn't it amazing... I'll tell you what, the devil is so coy. When this apostle says that Satan can transfer himself into an angel of light, it's almost an understatement. Why do you suppose if everything pertaining to the Gentiles is between Romans and Philemon, Paul's epistle, then why is 90 to 95% of your Sunday morning preacher across the land out of the four Gospels. Think about it. Hey, the devil knows what he's doing. They can preach the four Gospels till they're blue in the face, and you won't get Pauline doctrine because that's Jesus addressing Israel under the law. Now, my own pastor's guilty. And once in a while, he'll get into Paul's letters, and I'll ask him to weigh in, how long are your deacons going to leave you in Ephesians? Two weeks, and he's back in Matthew. And he's not alone, because 
all you have to do is look over that congregation. When he's in the four Gospels, they're sitting there, you know, right on the edge of their seat. You get him into the teachings of Paul and they're almost falling asleep. Hey, the devil knows what he's doing. This is the apostle of the Gentiles, see? All right, chapter 3 again of Ephesians. So he says, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, to you Gentiles. Now the word Gentiles isn't in there, but it's certainly implied. Now then, here comes verse 3. How that by what? Revelation. By a revealing, he made known unto me, the apostle of the Gentiles, the mystery, the secrets, the things that were never mentioned anywhere else in Scripture. And so that's why, again, when they try to jump the church up here into the seven years of tribulation, they're flying in the face of what Paul is teaching. Because, see, this is not part of the mystery. This was all back in prophecy. But we're dealing with things that were kept secret since the world began. And, <coughs> and that puts us in a place all by ourselves. And you can't push this up into the prophetic program. You do violence to Scripture. And all the manuscripts I keep getting, I got one a few years ago from one of the NBA basketball stars. Now, I'm not a name dropper, so I won't give his name. But he gave me a manuscript that thick. The Chicago Tribune had had a headlines that this guy was looking for the soon return of Christ. And that was admirable. But I went through that whole thick manuscript, and everything that he was using was the top line. The top line. He was quoting everything from the Old Testament, from the four Gospels, a couple from Acts, and the rest from Revelation. And he almost totally ignored Paul's letters. And so I wrote him, I thought, a real kind letter. And I said, you know, I admire you. You've done a lot of work. You've done a lot of study. But you've missed the ball. You struck out. You never went to Paul. You are in the Old Testament program concerning the second coming, which was all true. But he had nothing so far as the rapture of the church before the tribulation began. Okay, so back to Ephesians chapter 3. How by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Verse 4. Whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery or the secret things of Christ. Now what's he talking about? How that when Christ died that death of the cross, he took upon himself the sins of the whole world. You won't find that. Oh, I know John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. But that's as far as it ever went. But this man gets right down to the nitty-gritty how that Christ from eternity past was designated to go that way of the cross, to be raised from the dead, to bring salvation not just to Israel but to the whole human race. You won't get that until you get to Paul's revelation of the mysteries. That's why Paul also then refers to the rapture as a mystery. It's a secret. The rest of the scripture knows nothing of the rapture. So how in the world can they teach it out of the Old Testament or anything like that and put it back in the middle of the tribulation? Well, you can't because Paul alone teaches the rapture and Paul alone says it will come before the Antichrist does. But oh, they love to mix it all up and the angel of light, the God of this world, is reveling in it. We're getting more confusion about end time things in the last three years than I can think of in years gone by. And I can show it to you from our mail. Of all these manuscripts and these books that are coming out, putting the church into the tribulation. Garbage. That's what it is. Because this man says, 
we have nothing to do with what God's going to do with Israel. Thank God. Oh, man. I don't see why these people want to put us in the tribulation. That's going to be hell on earth. You know that, don't you? Man, I don't want to go in there. Okay, back to Ephesians, and then we got to keep moving. Ephesians chapter 3 again. So he says, whereby when you read verse 4, you may understand my knowledge and the mystery or the secrets of Christ. Now watch verse 5. Plain English, which in other ages, generations, was not made known unto the sons of men. See how plain that is? Nobody knew anything about this as it is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets. Now, he doesn't claim to be the only apostle. Barnabas was one. I think Silas was one. And they all got an understanding of these things. All right. Then I want you to bring down to verse 9. He's writing all this to make all men see what is the fellowship of the secret, which from the beginning of the world, from Adam has been, what? Hid in God. The same God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Now, you got the picture? This man had revealed to him things that no one else in human history ever had a clue. Now, the Lord knew, of course, but I'm talking about the 12 and so forth. All right, back to Galatians chapter 1. They let him down in a basket in the wall of Damascus, in the middle of the night. Where does he go? Well, now he tells us. Verse 13, he said, You've heard of my conversation or manner of living in times past in the Jews' religion. He was a persecutor. And how that beyond measure I persecuted the church or that Jewish assembly of believers in Jerusalem and wasted it. I profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals my own nation. In other words, he was accomplishing more from Judaism and he was cashing in on it monetarily. I think Saul of Tarsus was probably wealthy. But after his conversion, he chucked the whole thing and counted it but trash for the sake of the gospel. And that's when I think he lost his family. Yes, I think Saul of Tarsus was married and had children. He had to have been if he could vote to put these people to death in Acts 26, I think it is. And in order to vote, he had to be a member of the Sanhedrin. And in order to be a member of the Sanhedrin, he has to be married and have children. But all that went down the tube in order to keep the gospel going to the Gentile. All right. Verse 15. When it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his what? Grace. He didn't deserve it any more than you and I do. But God's grace poured out on the man and saved him, forgave him, cleansed him. Now verse 16, but what was the purpose? To reveal another revelation. To reveal his son in me that I might preach him among what people? The Gentile. See? The heathen. Now watch it. Immediately, as soon as he hit the ground in that basket, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither did I go up to Jerusalem to them who were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia. Now, again, stop and think. Saul of Tarsus knew all about Christ's earthly ministry. He knew all about the work of the Twelve. He knew they had been with Christ for three years. Logically, what would have been the thing to do? Well, get back to Jerusalem. Find the Twelve and find out firsthand from Peter, James, and John all about this Jesus of Nazareth. But the Holy Spirit didn't permit that. In fact, he made sure that did not happen. And so instead of letting Saul of Tarsus find his way back to Jerusalem from the backside of Damascus, he sends him the opposite direction. 
into Arabia. Now, you've got to know your Middle Eastern geography. Jerusalem is to the southwest from Damascus. Uh, uh, yeah, southwest. And Arabia is to the southeast. So instead of going to Jerusalem and checking in with Peter, James, and John, God sends him into the desert of all places. Now, I can't prove this, but I've got pretty good scripture. If you will come over to chapter 4 in this little book of Galatians, there's an interesting verse that if Saul of Tarsus was sent out into Arabia, I cannot envision our God as meticulous as he is with keeping everything in perspective that he would just send this man out into an empty area of the Arabian desert. But look what chapter 4, verse 25 says. Now, I don't want to be loose with Scripture, but on the other hand, I think we have enough here that I can pinpoint where in Arabia did the Lord lead this man. Verse 25, for this Hagar is Mount Sinai, where? In Arabia. Now, what's logical? Where did God give the law to Moses? Mount Sinai. Where did Moses take the law? To Israel. Now, isn't it only logical that the same God would take this man to the same mountain. And you know what the Arabs call what they think is Mount Sinai? You know what they call it? In the Arab, the mountain of God. They call it the mountain of God. Well, isn't it only logical that it was to that mountain then that God led Saul of Tarsus? I think so. And I usually put it on the board. The same God that gave the law to Moses and instructed him to take it down to the nation of Israel the same God now takes this man and gives him all of the revelation of the mysteries of the grace of God and he sends him out into the Gentile world. Our God is beyond comprehension. All right, let's go on. We're time is moving fast. So, back in chapter 1. So immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. I did not go to Jerusalem to check in with the twelve. But I went into Arabia. And for three years. Verse 18. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode in 15 days. Now if I can reconstruct after he was let down the wall in a basket and God led him out to Mount Sinai in Arabia and for the better part of three years God taught that man one on one one on one for three years now I think there's a twofold reason for it number one when you're as steeped in a religion as Saul was it's going to take a while to get it out of his system. That's only human nature. I found it, especially with people who have come out of a cult. Oh, listen, they wrestle with it. They see the truth. They put their faith in Christ. But all oh, that pull back into that cultic religion is unbelievable. That's the human makeup. And I think Saul was no different. So a good part of that three years, I think God had to cleanse the man of all that Judaism. The other reason I think he had to spend the whole three years in Arabia is because when he would begin his ministry, like I already mentioned, the Corinthians accused him of, you didn't have three years with Jesus like Peter did. What could he answer? Oh, yes, I did. I had my three years with him. And so I think God did that to balance the scales. And so just as sure as the 12 had their three years with Christ in his earthly ministry, the Lord Jesus spent three years with the apostle in Arabia. 
Now you can take that for whatever you think it's worth. All right, now let's move on. So he goes on up into Cilicia in verse 21, which was his hometown area of Tarsus, and he begins his ministry then up in the Gentile area of, of Cilicia and Tarsus. All right, now we come into chapter 2, which is just as enlightening as chapter 1. And remember, the whole purpose of this little Galatian letter is to prove that these Gentile believers that he has now settled in little congregations are not under the law. Now, you want to remember, Galatians is written almost 18 years after he begins his ministry. A lot of people do not realize that those early believers went almost 20 years without anything written except the Old Testament. That's amazing, Christianity got off the ground. But this little book is written about 58, 59 A.D., and I feel Paul began his ministry about 40. So here we are, 18, 19 years after he has begun his ministry amongst the Gentile, that he writes this. Okay? Now... He's been having so much opposition for 20 years from the Judaizers in Jerusalem that the Lord finally instructs the apostle, you get up to Jerusalem and confront these 12 with what I have shown to you. Okay, here it comes. Then 14 years after, that is after his conversion, three years in the desert, so we got 11 years after he has begun his ministry. So then he says, 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation. In other words, the Lord revealed to him, it's time to go up to Jerusalem. And I communicated unto them, the 12, that gospel which I preach among the Gentile. See how that designates it? He had to lay out to Peter, James, and John, and the rest of them what he was now preaching to the Gentile, which was far removed from what they had been preaching to Israel. All right, come on down to verse 4. And because of false brethren unaware brought in who came in privately or secretly to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they, the Jerusalem leadership, might bring us into bondage. Now, when Paul speaks of bondage, what's he talking about? The law. The law. And even Peter, back in uh, Acts, yeah, in fact, in Acts 15. Let's go back to her quickly. Acts chapter 15. In fact, we have to probably stop before we finish, and you can pick this up when you get home. Compare Acts 15 with Galatians 2. They are the same Jerusalem council. Acts is Luke's account, Galatians is Paul. All right, but look what Luke records in Acts 15. Verse 1. And this is what Paul was up against. And certain men who came down from Judea, that's Jerusalem, taught the brethren, that is, his Gentile believers, especially up in Antioch and on over into Asia Minor. And these Judaizers taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Did you read that? Did you read that? That was what Paul was up against. These Judaizers from Jerusalem were coming into his little Gentile congregations, and this is what they were telling them. Unless you practice circumcision, you cannot be saved. Well, that's the law. Okay, let's read on. When Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, 
they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others in them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles, the twelve, because they were the fomenters of all this. They honestly thought that these Gentiles had to become adherents of Judaism. All right, so the Lord sends Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem to settle the question with the apostles. All right, now I'm going to drop down for sake of time to verse 5. And there rose up, once they get to Jerusalem and they go into this council meeting, there arose up certain of the sect of Pharisees who believed they had recognized Jesus as the Messiah. And these Pharisees said that it was needful to circumcise them, Paul's converts amongst the Gentiles, that it was necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Can you put yourselves in Paul's shoes? Every time he would come back to a little congregation, they were all in a stir. Well, these men from Jerusalem says we have to practice circumcision. They're telling us we have to keep the law. We have to keep the Saturday Sabbath. We have to keep kosher. And it was driving Paul crazy. And so finally he gets this meeting in Jerusalem to settle. Verse 6 says it. And so the apostles and elders came together at Jerusalem to consider this matter. Now verse 7. When there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago. You know how long ago? Twelve years. Twelve years ago, Peter had witnessed salvation of the house of Cornelius. Now, when people try to tell you that the gospel went out to the Gentiles from the time of Christ on, hey, be willing to show them. If Peter saw the conversion of that Gentile house of Cornelius, why didn't he take off into the Gentile Roman Empire? Did he? No. Where did he go? Jerusalem. And when he got there, what happened? They called him on the carpet. Peter, how could you go into the house of those pagan Gentiles? And on top of that, you sat down and ate with them? Horror of horrors. And so here Peter has been cowering in Jerusalem for 12 years. They're not going out to the Gentile world. They're still ministering to the Jews in Jerusalem. And then they're trying to upset Paul's ministry by sending these Judaizers out there to tell Paul's converts that they have to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. Isn't that something? How many people hear that? Not many. But listen, this is what the apostle was up against. And Christianity has been fighting legalism ever since. Oh, it may not be circumcision today, but it's anything and everything else you can think of. And Paul's gospel, it's by faith alone, see? All right, now I think I've got enough here in Acts. But yeah, in verse 10, this is what I was referring to. So Peter finally comes to the conclusion that yes, Paul is right. He doesn't have to demand law-keeping and circumcision from his Gentile converts. So Peter says in verse 10, Now therefore, why test God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, that is, these Gentile believers, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? The law was a yoke. The law was the energy of the flesh. The law had no power like we have with the working of the Holy Spirit. Okay, now I've got to go quickly back to Galatians 1, or Galatians 2. We've got to finish that before we call it a quit, call it a day. My goodness, it's 4.30 already. You ready to go? Galatians 2. We'll wind this up as quickly as we can. Okay, verse 4. So Paul says they wanted to bring our Gentile converts back into bondage under the law. 
Verse 5, but Paul says, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. They were pressuring him, pressuring him all day long. Paul, you've got to agree to teach your people to practice circumcision and law keeping. And he would not. And then finally, of course, Peter came to his defense. All right, verse 6. But of these who seem to be somewhat whatsoever they were makes no matter to me. God accepts no man's person. God didn't care what Peter thought or what John thought. God is on his own program. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. And do you realize what that says? When Paul came to this meeting in Jerusalem and laid out that gospel which he was preaching to the Gentiles, and Peter, James, and John, I'm sure, tried to refute that, and he finally had to convince them that he had revelations that they knew nothing of. And that's what he means here when he says, they seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. Now next verse. But contrary wise, on the other hand, when they, the twelve, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, the gospel of the grace of God, was committed unto me as the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the circumcision was committed unto Peter. You see these two vast differences? The gospel of the kingdom under the law and for Israel was committed unto Peter and the eleven. The gospel of the grace of God outside of the law without circumcision, without law keeping, was committed to the Apostle Paul. Two totally different concepts. That's why I've had to drop it out of that prophetic timeline. This is something that won't fit in here. It has stopped the time clock until it is finished and with it out of the way, yes, then everything will keep on going according to the Old Testament format. All right, now... One more verse, and I've got to take you back to 2 Peter. Verse 8, still in Galatians 2. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the Jew. Now see how plain this is? For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the Jews the same. Well, who are we talking about? The same Christ. The same God. The same was mighty in me toward what people? The Gentile. See this constant separating them? Now the next verse. And when James and Peter and John. Now that's amazing right there and you didn't even catch it. How do we normally quote those three names? Peter, James, and John. But the scripture shows us something. Israel is falling through the cracks. The 12 apostles' ministry is disappearing right between their toes. And Paul is ascending. And so Peter is no longer the head honcho. He's not even the moderator of this meeting. James is. And that's why his name is first. And so James and Peter and John, who seemed to be pillars, they weren't anymore. It was falling apart. Israel was rejecting everything. And so these three men who seemed to be pillars perceived or understood the grace that was given to me. And when the Lord finally got through to Peter, James, and John, look what they did. They gave to me and Barnabas, Paul says, the right hands of fellowship. What'd they do? They shook hands. A gentleman's agreement. Paul will no longer interfere with your ministry to the Gentiles. We'll stay with Israel. You go to the Gentiles. A gentleman's agreement. 
And had they ever broken it, they wouldn't have been gentlemen. But it was a gentleman's agreement that they would stay with the Jew and Paul go to the Gentiles and only they would that we would remember the poor which of course Paul did. Alright, I'm going to give you one more verse and then I'm going to I guess have to call it quits. I hate to but we're going to have to come back to Peter's little letter the epistle of Peter the second one second Peter and I think you all remember that in this same second chapter of Galatians, Paul called Peter almost a hypocrite because he would not come in and eat with Paul's Gentile believers. He withdrew. And Paul says, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. He shouldn't have put those Gentiles and looked down his nose on them. They were just as much now the children of God as Peter or anybody else. And so he called him, withstood him to his faith. But look what good old Peter does. You know, I admire him. I know it's by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But look what Peter writes in his little epistle at the end of his life, just before he's martyred. Not up front, but at the end. All right, 2 Peter chapter 3. Verse 15 and 16. My, what an eye opener. All got it? Second Peter 3, 15 and 16. And Peter writes, account or understand that the long suffering of our Lord is what? Salvation. That's the whole purpose of this book is to bring lost mankind to an eternal salvation. God's not willing that any should perish. And so this is the whole purpose, is to bring salvation. Even, <coughs> even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you. What is Peter admitting? The Apostle Paul has knowledge that he knows nothing of. And so he says, you go to Paul. And he's writing to Jews. He says, you go to the epistles of Paul because he has revelations that I know nothing of. Quite an admission, wasn't it? And so he says, even as our beloved brother Paul according to the wisdom given unto him by those revelations as written unto you. And I think this is the book of Hebrews that he's referring to. And then he picks up all the other Pauline epistles in the next verse. As also in all his epistles, Romans through Philemon, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. Bless Peter's heart. What is he admitting? That Paul had revelations that he still couldn't understand. And he's next to martyrdom. And I don't know as Peter ever did get a full understanding of Paul's gospel. He, of course, was steeped in Judaism. He was a good Jew. He was an apostle of Israel. But to have an understanding of Paul's revelations, he has to admit that he doesn't understand it. And he wasn't alone. I'll read the rest of the verse. Which they that are unlearned and unstable twist, as they do also the other scriptures to their own destruction. Now, what is Peter putting on all of Paul's writings? His stamp of approval. Don't you ever let anybody tell you that they don't have to pay any attention to Paul. Peter says you'd better. Peter says you'd better. 
Now, in closing then, only Paul, only Paul speaks of what we call the rapture. That's why people got it all confused. Only Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. And why does it call it a mystery? Because no other portion of Scripture knows anything about it. And what is that mystery? That one day some of us who are alive are suddenly going to be gone. And in the next moment, the believers are going to be resurrected from the dead and so shall we go to be with the Lord. Only Paul teaches that. And that's why most of Christendom rejects the Apostle Paul. And that's why they reject rapture. Stay in the book. Don't go by what I say. Get in the book. Okay, let's stand and be dismissed. <coughs>